Hello, welcome to jasonnewland.com. My name's Jason Newland, and this is Short Anxiety Reduction. It's um, it's the third one so far, and the idea of these is I talk for about ten minutes ish. And give you some ideas of maybe things that you can do to reduce your anxiety. So just so you know what the title means, it's not just for people that are under five foot tall. It's, it's, it is for everybody. It's just uh, time-wise short. So you've got the... The question you probably have is, uh, who am I? What do you know about it? Would you? Well, um, I've had many years of experience with anxiety, and I still do, to be fair. And at times, less so than before. But then, um, you know, that's just the way it is. But I've had... Uh, my first bout of, uh, let's say, so I was diagnosed with stress after being ill for about 10 months and went through loads of tests at the hospital and they were doing everything. And uh, not everything, there was no, they didn't do any probing, but there was. Uh, they put it down to stress so uh, they put me on antidepressants and the physical symptoms diminished and went away and I was ill you know I was pretty uh, even the doctors thought there was something quite serious going on so that's something that doesn't get a lot of attention with anxiety and panic, um, it, quite often it's oh, anxiety. It's where you get panicky and you have a panic attack or anxiety attack. It's the same thing to me, and um, when it happens, a person could feel like they're going to die. They really, you know, I felt like I was going to die in the past. It's not an exaggeration. That's how I felt. Um, I wasn't going to die, but that's how I felt. And the this physical manifestation is there as well. This the physical part of it, which hasn't doesn't get a lot of credit, where actually somebody can physically feel ill. People can have alopecia. They can lose their hair due to stress. People can uh, get very physically ill due to stress and anxiety. Stress and anxiety, I class them together. I don't see any difference between stress and anxiety. Uh, As far as stress is not a problem if it's not making you ill. If it's making you ill, then it's anxiety. Then it's causing anxiety and physical problems. We all have degrees of stress and we need to in order to walk, in order to get out of bed, in order to do, you know, deal with life. There are levels of stress that we uh, all need to cope with to a degree. But when it gets to anxiety, then it's, it's not. It's not on. It's not on. So I don't want to spend the whole session talking about stress um, and the physical symptoms because it could be all kinds of things. And I still get that. Uh, With anxiety, I get a physical reaction. And it is a physical reaction anyway. It's a physical reaction for panic attack is a physical reaction as well as being a thinking, I just nearly knocked my glasses off. 
Um, I'm doing a lot of hand movements for some reason. Instead of being just a thinking thing or just a physical thing, it's a mixture. So someone's brain could be moving at like, feels like it's moving at a thousand miles an hour. Uh, but then the body's all kind of, you know, palpitations, breathings, going weird and all kinds of stuff like that. So what these sessions is about reducing the anxiety, okay? So I thought today, and I'd say, I want you to know that I'm, I understand what anxiety is, I understand what panic attacks are, I understand that stuff. But at the same time, it's different for everybody. We're all different. We're all different. And so, uh, if you look, I've seen somebody that's, because uh, you know, if someone's got an extreme phobia, being around a thing that they're phobic about brings on basically a panic attack. Uh, so if someone's uh, scared of snakes, that probably has a phobia of snakes, and you bring a snake to them, they're going to have a panic attack. It's just, and they're going to be absolutely terrified, and they're going to have all that physical stuff going on. And they're not going to function. Their brain will not function properly. So this is about getting your brain to function maybe a little bit easier in various different situations. And it's a gradual thing. It's not instant. I think anything that's instant isn't really worth too much. It can be instant, though. Sometimes. But, you know, if you went into a doctor's or a hospital and, you know, you had a, a condition that you'd been worrying about for ages and he came in and said, oh... Uh, it's all right, just, here's a plaster, stick this on it, you'll be fine, I'm sure. You probably think, oh no, actually, it needs a little bit more than this. So, this is a gradual continuation. What I was going to talk about is setting up triggers, setting up relaxing triggers. When I was doing a call centre, when I was last working in a call centre, I had this trigger and I didn't even know why it started. But one of the questions on the sheet that I had to ask people was, are you doing any educational courses? It was for car insurance. I don't know why that would even be valid, but that's one of the questions I was getting paid to ask. And whenever I asked it, I got a warm glow inside about uh, and then like a trigger about an upcoming hypnosis course that I was going to be doing and it happened every time every single time and at that time I started thinking I wonder how many more of these triggers I could have where you can feel good and you can feel relaxed because when you feel good you generally feel relaxed. Apart from, you know, I'm sure if you're jumping out of a plane, uh, parachuting or whatever, you might feel amazing, but I guess you're not... I can't imagine feeling relaxed would be a, a, up there on the list of uh, feelings that I would experience. I think the one thing I'd be probably thinking about is, do I have any spare pants on the ground that I can put on immediately? Uh, so... Where can you have these triggers set up? And it can be anywhere. And it can be anything. It could be as simple as when you go into the kitchen, do the washing up. And maybe you've got a memory, something that feels nice, something that you remember that actually uh, makes you feel good. Or it could be something as simple as putting a picture on the windowsill of the kitchen of somebody that you care about deeply. Be a picture of your grandchild or your, your, your partner or uh, your pet or 
it could be a picture of your favourite pop star, your favourite singer, your favourite athlete. You know, and that's something I think as adults, and I'm, I'm assuming that we're all adults here. There are going to be younger people listening as well, I suppose. But something I noticed is, as I got older, I don't have those feel-good things, those posters of pop stars. Uh, I don't have a poster of uh, maybe a singer that i am got a crush on. So there's no pictures of Madonna. When I was about 16, uh, there was a singer called Sabrina. She was, uh, I think she was Spanish. And I was just, I was besotted with her. I had a picture of her next to my bed, like literally right as I woke up and saw her. And it was a really lovely start to the day. Because I felt nice when I looked at her because I fancied her. This isn't about necessarily having uh, a hormonal reaction. <laughs> it could just be having a, a picture. So if you feel the same, if you've got a grandchild, and instead of having a picture on the fridge, which is kind of traditional, you know, like a, a painting that your grandchild has made at school, or maybe at your place where you are, and maybe have one in the bathroom, on the wall, maybe have one in, in the bedroom, on the side, maybe framed on the wall, maybe have one in your wallet or in your purse that you can pull out and look at, that helps you to relax, that helps you to get in touch with that that pure love that you have. Because it's very hard to actually, some some feelings don't really mix together very well. You know, in the same way some chemicals don't. You know, one chemical uh, might be very volatile, but when another chemical is added, it, it basically disrupts the other one. So it calms everything down. So it no longer has an effect in the same way as drugs can do that. There's certain drugs that can uh, undo the effects of any uh, of, an, of a, another drug that's been taken. It can undo that effect. There are drugs that ambulance people can give to someone who's drunk that can sober them up. So... I'm not a pharmaceutical expert. But this is chemicals in our brain. These are processes and reactions in our brain. So when you're looking at a picture, and it doesn't have to be a picture that's been drawn by your grandchild. This is just an example. I don't know your particular situation could be anything it could be a picture drawn by yourself it could be a picture drawn by you when you was a child it could be a photograph of your wedding or photograph of the birth of your child it could be a certificate from university or college it could be a menu it could be a menu from uh the restaurant that you went on your first date with your husband or wife. You know, it could be as simple as that, a receipt from, you know, a birthday party that you had in a restaurant or in a hotel that was special. It's just a trigger, a little trigger. And those feelings of happiness and joy outweigh any feelings of anxiety they're too strong and it's a bit like when you've got if you've got a it's an old analogy it's not my analogy you know you've got a glass of water and it's full of salt 
and you try and drink it, unless you like, really like salty water, you're not going to enjoy that. It's just like, ugh. But if you poured it into a bath of cold water, you're not even going to be able to taste the salt. Again, the idea of putting a straw in a bath doesn't really appeal to me. But I'm just saying, as an example, you're, you dilute it. So dilute the, the salt slash anxiety. So it doesn't have the same effect on you that it did. So I don't know what other things you could do. So you've got pictures you could put on the wall. You've got photographs. There's... It could be music that you play, a certain song that you like to listen to when you're doing the ironing. Or when you're... Um, down the shed. I'm trying to think of things that are, that are so out of my lifestyle. See, I don't iron and I don't, I don't have a shed, but I know that millions of people do have sheds and millions of people also care about their appearance. So having these triggers, these positive, happy triggers around you Wherever you go, when you're at work, I've seen people that work in call centers where it looks like they've got their entire family photo album on, you know, near their computer. They've got this, it's, I do wonder how they manage to maneuver around all the photographs, but it motivates them. It makes them clearly feel happy and helps them to get through any kind of anxiety or stress that they're dealing with or that might be there otherwise. It's very much a case of when you're hungry, you eat. But when you eat, that's an antidote to that feeling of hunger. So that hunger could be the anxiety, representing the anxiety. And you know, if you ignore it, you're gonna get hungrier and hungrier. But if you think of these looking at a picture or listening to some music as the similar thing to eating food when you're hungry then it changes changes the way you feel because no matter how hungry you are once you've eaten and if you've eaten enough you don't want to eat no more and you can see an advert for pizzas and KFC and McDonald's or whatever your favourite food might be and it doesn't look appealing at all because you're, you've eaten, you're full up. So as if that, you know, the, the idea of the anxiety tempting you and trying to sort of uh, catch you off guard, it can't because you've eaten in the same way as if you've got these positive triggers. Set up all around the place. Around your home, in your living room, at work, uh, in your bathroom, in the kitchen, in your shed, in your garage, in your car, if you drive. I'm not saying put lots of pictures 
of you know your children or grandchildren on the windscreen because obviously you won't be able to see nothing. Um, but you can have something in there to remind you of your grandchild or your children or your wife, your husband, your parents, your pet. For me, it would be Andre, my ferret. He's my family. So if I was going to, if I worked in a call centre and needed, you know, a trigger to feel calm and relaxed, I'd have a picture of Andre there. Because when I'm with him, I feel relaxed and calm. So that's just an idea. It's just, these are just ideas. That's why I call it short anxiety reduction. Because it's, it's an idea. It's just me talking about an idea. The thing is, and you may have already noticed this, but sometimes just by listening to the ideas actually increases your relaxation. So it's kind of a, it's a win-win situation. And what I've got out of this, which is quite quite weird, is, uh, and I'm telling you this, just because out of, well, we're all human beings, aren't we? We've got emotions, feelings. We've all got, um, we're all connected in some way. What I've got out of this recording that I've just made is something I said earlier, as I don't have pictures on my walls of pop stars and, uh, you know, I know I'm, 40, I'm 48, so it probably makes sense that a lot of people my age wouldn't have that. But then why not? Why have I, I have to, I can only do it when I'm 10 or 11 or 8 or 13, 14. Why not do it at 48? Why not have a picture on my wall of Shaken Stevens? Or Robin Williams, Mork and Mindy poster, poster of Bruce Lee. Or maybe something of this century. Why not? Because you can buy them. You can actually get them online. You can get big... I don't want a big poster. I don't want the whole wall taken up just by one picture. But... I'm going to look into that. What I would like is a picture of Milton Erickson. He's a hypnotist. Milton H. Erickson. I'd love a picture of him on my wall. And some like famous hypnotists. I'd like to have that on my wall. So as well as these suggestions, I'm going to be doing this stuff myself as well. And I have done in the past. In fact, I've got on my door, the door in my living room, as I go to go out of the door, on the door frame right at the top, it says, what does it say? Let's have a quick look. It says, I deserve to be happy. I wasn't sure if it said you deserve to be happy or I deserve to be happy, which is weird because I see it every day. I've had it up there for about a year and a half. I deserve to be happy. Not everybody is able to write stuff on walls and on doors, you know. We're not well able to do that. I, I can, as long as I paint over it when I move out. But that stuff sinks in. It sinks in. And it's a positive thing. It's a useful thing. 
a healthy thing. So I hope some of these ideas were useful and I will see you again next time. So please uh, visit my website jasonnewland.com where all my recordings are. Take care. Bye.